Friday evening at this time. And this is the last one of this year before uh, the summer break. Uh, I am very happy to introduce that folks to you. And I think that was just in an introduction. A number of people here uh, taught by that folks. Uh, uh, we learned communism, the history of uh, communism from that folks. And we are still using the rise of all communism in Eastern Europe, uh, Eastern Europe for Islamism to start nation. Uh, so that then folks told me and normal as undergraduates and, and because of that that then folks they decided to uh, to move uh, to the academics and, and study and research, find out more about the studies for the years of college. Exactly, exactly. He, he is the player. I mean sometimes my, my, my daughters, my children tell me that well what we are doing is really boring really. I said that but it's not my fault. <laughs> I play with some more exciting, doing more interesting jokes, but because but that was kind of instilled something inside of us, and they are still doing it. So, uh, Ben's going to talk about uh, Prof. Intern, the Red Integration of Labor Unions. Uh, this is based on uh, some uh, documents, I think they recently wrote and translated into English. Uh, so, we will uh, listen to them and then we as usual, we will a short break and, and after that we will make some questions and comments. Uh, by way of introduction, I should say that most of the material is taken from the Rhino Tostorf's book, which is called The Red International of Labor Unions, or the Rhino. And for now, I should call it Rhino for short, rather than the Red International of Labor Unions. This is the only book in English on the subject. The subject has been very little studied in the West. Unlike communist parties, which have been very much studied, communist trade unions have excited little interest over the years. So Rana Tostov made a sensible choice in entering a field that had hardly been ploughed at all. What I want to do here is to ask and answer one or two questions about this variety. First of all, what was it? The Bayou, also called the Provincen, was red, because it was the red international. Now, red doesn't necessarily mean communist. The name was chosen deliberately to have a broader appeal than communist, but simply to imply revolutionary. And then there's the other word, labor. Labor the word labour is used in English, although in many other languages it is referred to as the, referred to as the Red International Trade Unions. But they chose the title Red International Labour Unions to give it a broader and more inclusive coverage. So the idea was that it wasn't narrowly Red International Trade Unions, but to leave open the possibility that other labour organisations could also join. In fact, however, the RILU turned out purely to be an organisation of trade unions. The RILU was set up by the Bolsheviks in 1921 to coordinate the actions of communist or communist affiliated trade unions throughout the world. Why was it set up? That's the second question I want to ask. This is not entirely clear where it was set up. When, it was, when the common zone was created, it was quite clear. The common zone was set up to coordinate the actions of communist parties and communists in general throughout the world. And there were communist parties in Europe by that time, at least in Europe, but uh, not in most of the rest of the world. So there was something to coordinate. Whereas the uh, Rhino was set up, when the Rhino was set up, there was nothing much to coordinate. It was meant to coordinate trade unions, but there were almost no revolutionary trade unions. And if there were any revolutionary <coughs> trade unions, they were either syndicalist or anarchist and not communist. <coughs> So, why did they found it? Well, the Rado was set up, as E.H. Carr says, it was a step taken in a moment of hot-headed enthusiasm. 
or uh, as uh, Zinoviev said um, a little earlier, he said, the rivalry was founded at a time when it seemed we might be able to break through the enemy front in a head-on attack and rapidly conquer the trade unions. So the reason for setting up the rivalry was the attempt to conquer the trade unions from Amsterdam. Now, Amsterdam was the rival. Amsterdam was the headquarters of IFTU, the International Federation of Trade Unions, which was uh, refounded in 1920, although it had already been founded once in 1913, and then obviously with the First World War it fell to pieces, but then it was refounded, the IFTU, in 1920 as a social democratic uh, trade union international. <coughs> And clearly this would be uh, uh, hostile to the Bolsheviks and they wanted to find to establish a rival group and this was the, uh, the, the, the rival. So this was the attack against Amsterdam. Again I quote Zinoviev, the chief enemy is Amsterdam and not Brussels. <laughs> it makes make one think of Brexit. Um, <laughs> so the chief en enemy was Amsterdam, and Brussels, of course, it was Zinoviev who is referring there to the Second International. So the, the, the chief enemy for him was the trade union international, the IFTU, and not the Second International of, of uh, Socialist or Social Democratic Parties. So they set up this organization against uh, Amsterdam. And the hope was that they would rapidly conquer the trade unions, which I think was a very difficult task. Uh, before I continue the story, though, I have to outline some complexities in the uh, relationships between the various trade unions, because it is a very complex story. So first, there are craft unions. Craft unions are unions <coughs> for workers in a specific trade, in a specific country. For example, in Britain, you had the mine workers, the metal workers, the seamen, just examples, and many others. And these unions, craft unions, were associated together in what we call national trade union centres. And of course, in Britain, that was the TUC. In uh, Germany, it was the ADGB, and so on and so forth. So you have the second element, then, were the national trade union centres. You have first, the craft unions, second, uh, up stage up the hierarchy, you have the national trade union centres, and then the top of the hierarchy, you have the International Association of Trade Unions, or the International Federation, which is if true, and of course, which Rider hopes to, to replace. So you have these three levels. And that's, as it were, um, a, uh, a, a vertical uh, hierarchy, one, two, three. But in addition to this vertical group to the top, there was also a horizontal route, and that is with the craft unions, back to the craft unions, the craft unions in the individual countries were also joined together horizontally in what were called international trade secretariats. So the metal workers of each country joined the International Metal Workers Federation, and the transport workers joined the International Transport Workers Federation, and so on and so forth. And these organizations, these federations, as they were called, were actually called ITSs, or International Trade Secretariat. So that was the customary name for them. So each of the national craft unions in the different countries joined together to form international trade secretariats. So you've got both um, the national trade union centers and the uh, IFTU, the International Federation of Trade Unions, and International uh, Trade Secretaries. So you've got a rather complex picture. And there were 28 International Trade Secretaries in 1922. So, returning to the RILU. Uh, what this situation meant for the RILU was that it could insert itself at three levels. It could insert itself at the grassroots level of the individual trade union first. It could insert itself at the, at the national level of the National Trade Union Centre. And it could in intervene at the level of the International Trade Secretariat, these, uh, this horizontal uh, group uh, of, of each 
the Association of East Craft in, internationally. And uh, to do this, the RILU set up yet another initial IPCs or International Propaganda Committees. And the International Propaganda Committees were supposed to uh, intervene in the International Trade Secretaries and, to, and get them to join the RILU. So uh, a lot of complex um, uh, maneuvering uh, goes on. Now, they tried very hard to, with these uh, IPCs, as they're called, to get the international secretaries in, but they didn't really succeed. Simultaneously with this, you have the Russian trade unions. And the Russian trade union center, also, because uh, it felt it was a national trade union center, um, it tried to get into the various, oh, sorry, uh, I'll re rephrase that. The individual Russian trade unions tried to get into the international trade secretariats, and they failed, with just one exception, the International Union of Workers in the Food and Drink Trades, and this allowed the Russians in by 22 votes to 20. Um, and they stayed in until 1929. Um, but the, the intention of joining this uh, secretariat was to get it to join the RILU, and it never did. So, it, the, although the Russians managed to join it, they didn't manage to alter its policies. Um, now, this failure uh, with the RTSs is not surprising because they were all run by social democratic executives, which were utterly committed to the IFTU. The so, the next question I want to answer is, what forces did the rivalry represent? There was always a lot of argument about this. The head of the rivalry, Alexander Lodowski, claimed that it represented 18 million workers, but 6.5 million of these were members of Soviet trade unions, so they had to be members anyway. And that leaves 11.5 million in the capitalist world. Actually, in terms of numbers, it's not far behind the IFTU, which represented 17 million workers in 1919. Now, the RILU's main support came from communist workers first and foremost. The communist workers were minorities within particular trade unions in each country. The communist workers never succeeded in taking control of their unions because as soon as they became strong enough to do so, the social democratic trade union leadership expelled or suspended them, and they then had the option of either knuckling under or founding their own separate communist union. Now, the usual line taken by the Comintern and also by Lalu was that communists sort of should always avoid setting up their own separate union at almost any cost. They should submit and wait for better days. Obviously, while protesting about against being expelled. But there is a further side to this story, and that is that the appeal of the RILU was not limited to Orthodox communists and members of the traditional socialist trade unions, because there was a worldwide wave of popular revolt, which was anarchist and syndicalist, and not just Bolshevik after the First World War. And the RILU was, was intended to appeal broadly to all revolutionary trade unionists. The head of the RILU, Lozovsky, as speaking in 1922, explicitly stated that the RILU was set up to attract non-communists. I quote, If it were merely a question of communist cells in the trade unions, it would be very simple, <coughs> because communist forces in the union movement do not need a new international, they already have the common term. So why the RILU? Because it unites the revolutionary trade union movement in all its many forms, in all its diversity. And there was a very great amount of diversity. This included groups like the United States-based IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, which is the Wobblies, so called. It included the CNT in Spain, the CSRs in France, the MAS in the Netherlands, the USI in Italy, the AAU 
and the FAUD in Germany, and a number of other syndicalist groups in Germany. And all these groups did not support the Bolshevik view of communism. But they did have much in common with the Bolsheviks. They had in common, first, that they aimed to overthrow capitalism, a second, that they did not think this could be done by parliamentary means. A third, they believed in organizing workers at the point of production to do this. Fourth, they were internationalists. Fifth, they believed in equality. And sixth, they looked forward to a world without class divisions. And on all those points, they were in line with the communists. Where they differed from the communists was on the question of method. <coughs> they opposed political parties. <coughs> They opposed participation in conventional politics. <coughs> they thought workers should be organized into one big union rather than the basis of individual trades. They thought the only route to victory was through a general strike. They shared the anarchist hostility to the state, which meant they opposed the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat. So they had a lot of differences. But they greeted the October Revolution with enthusiasm and they were attracted to the idea of an association between revolutionary trade unions, which is what the right will look like. Despite their sympathy for the October Revolution, the syndicalists did not want to join the Comintern, and they did not want to become subordinate to the Comintern. The American syndicalists, the IWW, were opposed to involvement in politics they did not want to become part of the Comintern because it was a political organisation. But they did find an international trade union organisation acceptable. And the same was true of many other syndicalists in 1920 and 1921. In fact, so many syndicalist groups were represented at the first Congress of the Rhineland in 1921 that Lozovsky had to develop a method of had to develop a method of voting to ensure that the communists did not get outvoted by, by the syndicalists. So it, what he did was he grouped all the representatives of one nation together and they gave, they gave each nation's delegation a quota so they could not exceed that quota. So we have this uneasy association between syndicalism and communism. This was temporary. And after not many years, a syndicalist support fell away. Um, but one group to stay within the Rairu was the French CGTU. This was a syndicalist group that did so. And in fact, many individual syndicalists uh, didn't leave the Rairu with their um, compatriots or, or comrades. But they, instead, they remained with the Rairu and became communists. And that applies to people like Nien, who was from the CNG, but then and moved over to communism. And these people did not stay syndicalists. So you could say that the alliance between syndicalism and communism was the result of a misunderstanding because the syndicalists originally had illusions about the meaning of the October Revolution and the nature of, and the nature of Bolshevism. You could say that. Or could you, you might well say that they didn't have illusions, but that the attitudes of both parties at the time were different from what they turned out to be later. Both syndicalists and communists believed in the necessity for the revolutionary overthrow of capitalism. This brought them together. They could cooperate on this basis. And in fact, there's one remarkable example of this from Germany, where the German syndicalists set up port bureaus in North Germany, which took care of sailors when they went ashore, and indeed engaged in some sabotage actions against the German Navy. But that's a rare exception. The fact remained that in most countries, the syndicalists were small minorities, dwarfed by the huge social democratic trade unions, and Lozowski and his Rairu would have much preferred to bring the big unions into his organization. And uh, the other problem with the syndicalists was that they were also opposed by other syndicalist groups who uh, didn't really think it was a good idea to, to join Bolshevism at all. And these other syndicalists set up their own rival organization called the IWMA, or International Working Men's Association. And this organization was, in fact, joined by most of the syndicalist groups 
which in 1921 had cooperated with the uh, Raidu, and then by 1922 they abandoned the Raidu and moved over to, um, to the IWMA. So, so much for the syndicates in the, in the Raidu. And now I want to move on to the question of what issues <coughs> divided the Raidu in the 1920s. The big issues were the United Front and whether separate unions should be formed. But before dealing with that issue at the first Congress, they had to have a big argument over mandates, which I won't go into in detail, but it shows the argument in mandates, which is especially prominent in the USA for the US and the German delegations. The argument over mandates really related to um, how many mandates syndicalist representatives should have and how many communist representatives. So it's really an argument about voting strength. Um, and voting in that dispute was on strict syndicalist communist lines, and as a result, the syndicalists were outvoted and they lost many mandates at the Congress, which they weren't pleased about. And the, in fact, the decision over mandates prefigures the way decisions would go in the whole uh, Congress. Um, nevertheless, uh, there, were syn there were syndicalists like Maureen and Nin of the Spanish CNT who abandoned syndicalist principles and decided they would go along with, with the, um, uh, the right of point of view. Uh, so Congress, concrete arguments on strategy, as opposed to just on mandates, uh, took place mainly over the United Front. The United Front contradicted the original conception of the Rider. The Rider was set up to organize internationally against Amsterdam, to organize against the official trade union movements of the advanced industrial nations. Ideally, the aim was to get these trade unions to break with Amsterdam and join the Rider. But that did not happen. Instead, what happened was, communist minorities grew up within each trade union, never in the majority, always in danger of being expelled, and always being accused of splitting the movement. So that was a difficult problem to deal with. Sometimes they did split off. This happened in Germany briefly in 1924, for example. But the usual line of both the Rhino and the Comintern was that communists should stay within social democratic trade unions and try to persuade them to join the Rhino. And there were in fact two places where the Rhino had <coughs> outstanding success. One was in France and one was in Czechoslovakia. In France, the uh, CG2, CG, sorry, CGT split and the syndicalists formed their own trade union centre, the CGTU, which entered the road. And in Czechoslovakia, the communist workers felt strong enough to form a separate trade union centre, the NVS, which took away about one half of the membership of the existing social democratic uh, trade union centre which was the OSC. So there were two successes in that area. And that's really the reason why there was quite a lot of workers organised within the Rhino uh, in the 1920s. Most social democratic trade union centres were subject to severe, severe discipline exerted from the top down. Troublesome communist individuals were likely to be expelled. Even so, the Rhino was insistent that its members should stay within the existing trade unions. And if they were expelled, the Rhino called on them not to make up separate unions, but to, I quote, struggle for readmission to the reformist unions. This advice was a big source of dispute with both the French, French and the Czechs. In Czechoslovakia, the communist-run MVS was repeatedly castigated by Lozovsky for encouraging communists to leave the reformist trade unions. And in France, the communist-run CGTU did exactly the same thing, and he was also attacked for doing that by Lozovsky. However, there was one <coughs> curious uh, exception to this situation, and that was during the revolutionary period in Germany in October to November 1923. In November 1923, Lov Lozovsky, who was present in Germany, who was in Berlin at the time, uh, wrote that as the KPD had 50% of trade union members behind it, they should set up parallel trade unions. And he added, if the Yugoslavs can do it under a condition of white terror, why can't we do it in Germany? 
So this was Lozovsky's uh, embarrassing statement in, in November 1923. Of course, the revolution failed, it didn't happen. And then uh, in uh, April 1924, Lozovsky did what we would now call a U-turn um, and said that uh, the idea of splitting unions was absolutely wrong. And in fact, he was attacked for this U-turn by both Karl Radek and Ruth Fischer at the Fifth Comintern Congress. Um, and it was predicted that when Lozovsky presented his report to the Fifth Comintern Congress, he would not mention the word Germany, and he didn't, because it was too embarrassing. So that was just an exception. The basic point that they reached by the Fifth Comintern Congress in 1924 was, I quote, that to abandon existing trade unions was equivalent to desertion from the revolution. The establishment of separate communist trade unions, as advocated by Schumacher in 1924, was absolutely out of the question for the Comintern and the Rilo at that time. Even existing syndicalist unions, were, such as the um, Union of Workers by Hand and Brain, the UHK, or the Maritime Union, Schiffersbund, even those existing syndicalist unions in Germany were forced to re-enter the ADGB, the Social Democratic Trade Union. So the, the line was very, very firm against the uh, establishment of separate uh, trade unions. But that did not really solve the dilemma faced by communists who were expelled from reformist trade unions and never allowed back into them. So that was a situation in countries where the social democracy exerted a very strong disciplinary uh, force. In some other countries though, such as Britain and the USA, the trade unions were less centralized. Then the situation was different. There were some opportunities there for communists to work within existing trade unions. The shop stewards movement had done this in Britain during the First World War, and most of its representatives soon went over to communism and joined the Royal League. And in 1921, the South Wales Miners' Federation voted to join the RILU, but a few days later, the Miners' Federation of Great Britain, the, the larger federation, voted against. The Welsh debated whether to join as a separate organisation, but they decided against it, because if they had been, they would have been expelled. Um, but they did send their own delegates to the next uh, RILU Congress. The situation with the Welsh miners was not repeated in the rest of the country where the communists were far weaker in the trade union movement. In fact, in, on, to the fourth Comintern Congress, the British delegates, uh, Clark, said that the CPGB has practically no influence on trade unions and not one single trade union has joined the Rhino. But local branches did join. And it was on this purely local basis that the National Minority Movement was formed in 1924 and its aims were stated by the later communist leader Harry Pollitt as to unite the workers in factory committees, not, he stressed, to encourage the formation of any new trade unions. After 1921, and even more after 1925, the United Front tactic was difficult to handle because it meant cooperating with the rival in Amsterdam. Most advocates of the United Front were hostile to the rival, because it was an obstacle to cooperation with Amsterdam. So when some parts of the KPD moved to the right after the failure of the March action of 1921, voices were raised calling for the abolition of the right wing. Paul Levy, the former leader of the KPD, was strongly in favor of getting rid of the right wing, and his supporters inside and outside the party pressed for its abolition. Let it return to its maker in peace, said Levy. And then another trade unionist, or rather a trade unionist of the KPD said, we cannot see why this tactic applies only to individual organisations and is not also valued as an, at an international level. If you want to avoid a split in the trade unions, why are you splitting on the international level? To split the trade unions is absolutely out of the question, said Friesland, the new KPD leader. Um, so in that context then of the rise of the United Front in 1922, a lot of people, a lot of communists in Germany wanted to abolish the Rhino. But Lozovsky's chief argument in favour of keeping it, when he spoke to the Fourth Comintern Congress, was this. If the Rhino just consisted of communists, it wouldn't be needed. 
but it actually unifies communists, syndicalists, and all left revolutionary workers. So to liquidate the Rhino would mean to narrow the basis of communist action. So the Rhino survived, despite the amount of front and despite the fact that very few syndicalists were left within its ranks after 1922. Another source of dispute was the relationship with the Comintern. Some people thought the Rhino should simply act as a trade union section of the Comintern. Rosowski insisted it should be independent, though with close links. How close should those links be? Lozanski wanted an organic link with the Comintern, but he had to compromise on this, as the French trade union centre, the CGTU, because of its syndicalist attitudes, was hostile to the idea. Um, and this goes a long way back to the Charter of Amiens in 1906, according to which trade unions should not become associated with the political party. So there was no official link between the Rhino and the Comintern. There was an informal link. But in practice, it made no difference because after 1925, any declaration by the Rhino, said the Comintern, would have to be examined by the ECI, the Executive Committee of the Comintern, in advance before the Rhino was allowed to say anything. So this brings me on to the next point, which is to what extent did the Rhino play an independent part? Well, it is quite clear that the Comintern was happy to issue instructions on trade union matters without consulting the Rhino. The Rhino just had to fall into line. As Zinoviev pointed out in 1921, rather grudgingly, the Rhino must have a degree of independence, but the Communist International must absolutely retain political leadership. So, the Rhino was not independent. <clears throat> Even so, there are some details of separate activity of the Rhino one can mention. It organized international trade union campaigns, it organized a day of struggle against unemployment internationally in 1930-1931. It tried to help the German Revolution in 1923 by encouraging the CGTU to stop German, uh, sorry, French intervention if the revolution got off the ground. Um, and uh, the leftist uh, ITF, sorry, International Food and Drink Workers Association leader, Finman, wrote to Zinoviev in October 1923 saying, uh, the revolutionary offensive is impossible, we must concentrate on the United Front. So that was really uh, a move against um, the attempt to make a revolution in October 1923. But more, more important than, than minor activities was what the Rhino did outside Europe. It stepped outside Europe to agitate in the colonial and semi-colonial world. And its approach was slightly different from the concerns, it said, in that it condemned the reactionary nationalism of the colonial and semi-colonial indigenous bourgeoisie, forces like the Guomindang in China, or the supporters of Gandhi in India, and it stressed the importance of leading the worker and peasant masses against indigenous bourgeois forces. Whereas for the Comintern to form an international, sorry, whereas the Comintern saw the most important task as forming an anti-imperialist front with the national bourgeoisie against Western imperialism. I hasten to add that the Comintern was not unaware of the contradiction between the interests of the national bourgeoisie and the colonial countries and the interests of the worker and peasant masses, but that it placed the accent slightly differently from the Rhino. The Rhino placed a much stronger accent on the, on the divergent interests of the uh, worker and peasant masses of, of the colonial and semi-colonial countries. Uh, Tostorf discusses these worldwide activities, but only in footnotes, <coughs> one of which mentions contacts in India, rather disappointingly, <clears throat> but he does look at China in some detail. Uh, a delegation was sent by Rao to give advice to the Chinese trade unions and to express solidarity. Um, it, was, uh, it included Tom Mann from Britain and Earl Browder from the USA. And later the same year, Lozovsky himself <laughs> spent time in China and attended a Pan-Pacific conference in Wuhan under the direction, the protection of the left Guomindang, which was in control there. As, as you may recall, at that time there had been a split between the Guomindang itself and the left 
uh, of, of that party, and the, of the left wing thing, was uh, a, uh, collaborate to some extent with the communists in a united front. At this conference, attended by representatives of eight countries, the Pan Pacific Trade Union Secretariat was set up to support the Chinese Revolution and fight imperialism all over the Pacific region. But, uh, as is well known, uh, the left Wuomintang, sorry, left Wuomintang, immediately after that broke with the communists and repress, repression destroyed the communist movement completely. So that was a non-starter, but at least it was an attempt by the right to, to form this kind of alliance. There was also a League Against Imperialism, which was set up in 1921, which was intended to combine nationalists and left social democrats and revolutionaries, um, and it, well, this was supported by the right Um And then one could also mention Latin America, which I won't go into in detail, but in Latin America, particularly in Mexico and Argentina, there were um, groups which, were, uh, which joined the Bailu and, and were uh, fairly revolutionary. Uh, one thing is clear, the Bailu was faced with a tremendous variety of national situations, and the balance of forces varied from country to country. <coughs> In Spain, there was a very weak Communist Party and a solidly social democratic union, the UKT, but also a strong syndicalist movement under anarchist influence, the CNT, in Czechoslovakia, there was a very strong Communist Party and a previously social democratic trade union movement which split, forcing a large minority group to establish a separate trade union centre. In France, there was a strong Communist Party, but the trade unions were under syndicalist influence, and the new union, affiliated to the RILU, which was the CGTU, was composed of both communists and syndicalists. So the point here is that there was a tremendous variety of situations um, over, at least over Europe, and in, in the wider world too. So the next question is, what was the impact of wider common and Bolshevik policies on the right of the world? Well, as mentioned earlier, the very existence of the right was put in doubt by the United Front. And also, in the mid-1920s, when the United Front got going again, it also then again faded into obscurity, because there were high hopes uh, that the TUC in Britain would confront the government in the general strike, and there was also a considerable amount of cooperation uh, <clears throat> between the Russian trade unions and the TUC, um, even though the TUC was a member of IFTU, the rival, the Amsterdam rival. Um, at the time, <clears throat> Arthur McManus, for the Communist Party of Great Britain, warned against the illusion that there was a left wing in the IFTU that could be relied on. He, he warned against that in 1924. And it was an illusion. But the Bolsheviks were very keen to pursue this course in the mid-1920s. And in fact, they were so keen that the head of the Russian trade unions refused to attend a conference of the minority movement in Britain because he thought it would upset the TUC and make unity negotiations more difficult. So in other words, this period of cooperation uh, was a low point for the Rider. And the end of the cooperation, after the failure of the general strike, meant that the Rider was again in fashion. And this brings me on to the left turn in 1928. In December 1928, uh, Stalin intervened directly to shift the Rider's line to the left. He said, a situation is conceivable in which it may be necessary to create parallel mass organizations of the working class against the will of the trade union bosses who have sold themselves to the capitalists. We already have such a situation in America. It is quite possible that things are moving in the same direction in Germany as well. Now, that statement could be interpreted as an invitation to communists to set up separate unions. In other words, to go against the party which they've been pursuing for the previous 10 years. And in fact, separate communist trade unions were set up in various countries. Uh, the USA, a national miners union, and the national textile workers union was set up. Um, and also uh, the TUEL was converted into a revolutionary federation called the Trade Union Unity League, which was out outside the official American union, which was the AFL. Um, and this, as I, I repeat, this was a reversal of the policy that Rydley had pursued, uh, pursued for the previous seven years. In Germany, the situation was not quite so clear. The revolutionary trade union opposition, founded in 1929, 
um, was actually aimed at organizing dissensions within the ADG um, and not persuading them to, to form separate unions. But there were a few communists who wanted to go further. And this lasted for a very short time. In February 1930, they were called to order by an ECCI resolution which stressed work within the reformist unions. And the head of the revolutionary trade union opposition, Karl Merkel, tried to resist this. The only result was his removal from office for leftist deviation. There were a few red unions set up at this time in Germany, but they didn't last very long. And there were, uh, there were material reasons for this too. The situation of severe unemployment, and with unions in retreat, there was no strong impulse to organize separately. And with the Nazi danger, politics took precedence over everything else. In the two countries where the Rilu had mass trade union support in after 1928, the post-1928 shift to the left resulted in a split. In Czechoslovakia, the NPS split in half, and in France, the majority of the CGTU went along with the left course, but a minority was expelled for trying to continue to work for trade union unity with the CGT. So, uh, to conclude on this point, the RILU uh, was, uh, was in a better position uh, when the left line was uh, in operation because its separate existence was not thrown down. After 1933, as we all know, the left line was abandoned everywhere and this decision worked against the RILU. It could hardly go against the common zone though and the move to the popular front after 1924 was not opposed. The RILU now called for trade union unification. Negotiations in France between the two rival unions, the CGT and the CGTU, led to unification in 1936. In Spain, the communist trade unions dissolved themselves. Similar unifications took place all over the world. And this meant the RILU no longer had any reason for existence, as there were no longer <coughs> any separate communist trade unions to administer. There were still communists within the trade unions, but under the Popular Front policy, their aim was to combine with Social Democrats in fighting fascism and not to attack them. Dimitrov struck the final blow to the Rilu in a 1936 letter to Stalin. The Rilu, he said, not only fails to contribute to international trade union unity, but it's even a hindrance to it. With the merger of the trade unions in France and Spain, it has lost its independent trade union base in the capitalist countries. Stalin no doubt agreed with this, and a few months later, the Rilu was dissolved. Its head, Lozovsky, was given other work as Deputy Foreign Minister, and its foreign personnel were sent home, all except the Poles. Its archives were handed over to the Commons. The final question I want to answer is, did the Rilu achieve anything or play a significant part in history? Historians differ about this. E. H. Carr considered it was the most powerful and independent organization, subsidiary organization of the Comintern. Jeff Swain wrote it was never more than a footnote. Was this true? Tostov doesn't give an answer to this question because he is largely concerned with how the Rider was organized. He says little about what the Rider actually did, but his implied conclusion is very negative. He says the Rider's organizations did not protect did not protect the economic interests of the workers or work to maintain trade union achievements. Was this always true? Even if true, it could still be argued that the aim of the rival was not to protect workers' interests specifically, but to overthrow capitalism. The rival was also useful to communist trade unionists because it provided a unifying slogan, Moscow or Amsterdam, which gave them a clear fighting objective. It should also be added that unlike its rival, the IF2, which had no interest in fighting imperialism because of its composition, the RILU was unconnected to colonial powers, unless you count Russia as a colonial power, and agitated against colonialism and semi-colonialism. The general line taken by the RILU for most of its history was to combine the four aims, promote workers' interests, organize for the overthrow of capitalism, fight against imperialism, and finally, assist and defend the Soviet Union in any way possible. Thank you.
thank you very much for this extremely interesting and beautiful original presentation. Let's have a short break, ten minutes, uh, and then we can continue with the questions. I, shall, shall we start the questions uh, and comments section? And when you are asking or when you are commenting, please uh, introduce yourself. It's not, it's not actually my copy. Give your name. Okay. Uh, any, Ismail. Okay. My name is Ismail. Uh, I have actually two questions from before and after you told us about the Rhino. Uh, first, was it a planned split? Was it uh, something that social democrats forced communists to take decision, or was it communists' own decision to split the workers' unions and create revolutionary brigades, so to say? And second question, uh, together with this question, have communists made factionalism in the big unions? Did they, uh, did they uh, seek fac their own factions, their own groups? I ask these questions because we have had the same trouble in Turkish working class last 50 years. Socialists tried to split and they have split the existing union and they created something called revolutionary trade unions which has never become a uh, big force but it has been instrumental in, uh, in uh, asking for the revolutionaries, progressives come together but today we have a few people who are progressives completely isolated from the rest of the unions. This is the result we are picking. There have been many positive things in the past, but today it comes that this split has, uh, has not benefited working class, nor the revolutionaries. That's what I think. Okay, um, well, I mean, first of all, I, I have to say that there is every, a very diverse set of situations. In other words, what happened in Turkey wouldn't necessarily be happening in Czechoslovakia, wouldn't necessarily be happening in the same way in, in Britain, and so on and so forth. So very diverse group, group of situations. So I don't think one can say, you know, in, a, in an overall generalizing way, and say this is, uh, this is how it happened. It happened in different ways in different times. Uh, as far as the specific question of the foreign foundation of the way there is concerned, um, which I think is what we, you started with, um, and I haven't forgotten the other question was, as far as the specific question of the formation of the way there is concerned, I think um, it, the, the fact of the October Revolution meant that there was this division of opinion already existed. I mean, it, it existed in the, in the whole world, it existed in, and, and it, in itself it led to divisions within the trade union. So I think that's what one should concentrate on, that this, this, this was a divided situation in the first place, and it's a question of how you responded to it. Now, what the, what the people in Amsterdam responded to was by setting up this IFTU, and then in response to that, in response to the decision by Amsterdam to set up the IFTU, then, um, the Bolsheviks, or um, again, I think I said at one point, it's not quite sure how this actually took place, but or why it took place. But but certainly in response to the decision to set up the Amsterdam Union uh, in 1920, the Bolsheviks decided to explore the possibility of setting up some uh, or of organising, shall we say, uh, communist uh, trade unions and revolutionary trade unions, and so they set up what was called the ITUC. Uh, in order to not to make things too complicated, I missed that out. But actually, they set up what was called the International Trade Union Council, which was not a rival international, it was the International Trade Union Council. And that was the first stage of this development. And the, so you had the International Trade Union Council in 1920, and then it was decided at the International Trade Union Council that they should set up a proper international 
uh, rival to Amsterdam, which was the profit turn of the, uh, of the railway, as it's called in English. Um, so that was, that's the way I'd answer the first question. And as for the second question, I think that's very important what you say. Uh, the very important question is something I completely missed out. We, we, again, uh, you know, I can't include everything. Um, communist fractions. Clearly, um, the advice and the, uh, of the RALU, which is also in line with the advice of the common term, was that where there were communist workers in any trade union, they should form a fraction, or, or in English sometimes called a cell, a communist cell. And that was the instruction of, of the RALU, and that, that was another comment, and that was universally agreed that that's what should be done. Now, this didn't actually happen in a very systematic way, and the whole the literature, as I'm sure that uh, Dory will confirm, the literature is completely full of complaints about the failure of uh, parties, uh, particularly, to 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 um, to push forward the introduction of of of, of cells into various organisations, and it's, it's full of these complaints. But I mean, under this kind of pressure, they did finally. Um, Produce that they did finally create the communist fraction. So I mean, there were a lot of, there were actually quite a few trade unions which didn't like the idea of it. Um, I think the Czechos, just think of the Czechoslovaks again. The Czechoslovaks were, were rather against it in the NVS. They they thought that well, we have a trade union. Why on earth should we be setting up separate cells when we already control the trade union? So I mean, there, there were objections and, op and opposition. <coughs> the line of the common turn and which is always exactly the same as the line of the rider, the line was that uh, communist uh, fractions should be set up in any organisation that communists uh, join. So that's the answer to the second question. Uh, my questions are, are, are kind of on general, or, uh, or I should say that I am Nori, man with Bulland, I think you already know that uh, I 30 years on, I'm still a student uh, uh, of Bay. So to speak. Uh, so my, my question is, is really about the kind of aims and objectives of communism. And uh, what I enjoyed most about uh, Ben's paper was that it gave us a kind of, it really painted that communism was a global movement. That, I mean, it really uh, 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 sees a revolution, especially in these early years, in global terms. So my question <coughs> is, there was one aim from early on, and that is really defense of the Soviet Union by being able to demonstrate that there were communists in parliaments, there were communists in trade unions, there were people who were ready to take to the streets and, you know, aid for Soviet Russia, to support Soviet Russia. And what more recently I've suspected is that this is in fact, a lot of this is in fact uh, for propaganda, that this is to say we are here, don't touch us. The actual policy that appears to count is the same to the lines, whether it is the League Against Imperialism, the RILU, cultural or sporting organisations, which we also don't know so much about, all the parties, and Bolshevization meant reorganization on the basis of party cells. When it came to revolution, the Bolsheviks still wanted this up to 1923 in Germany, and Lozovsky was in Germany, he was in Berlin. And when the revolution faltered because of a meeting of factory cells or factory groups in Dresden, uh, the centre of where they wanted to launch the revolution failed and they tried to spread it through a kind of uh, a complicated process. The actual way the Bolsheviks wanted to launch revolution was the Red Army were on standby, they had food supplies being rushed into Germany, they wanted to cause a kind of civil war situation where they used nationalist propaganda to incite opinion uh, in the Ruhr. Trotsky said, don't worry, at the meeting, at the decisive meetings in Moscow, Trotsky said, do not worry about nationalist propaganda, worry about making the revolution. So when the moment of revolution came, it closely focused on a plan worked out in the Politburo, and the trade unions were very secondary, they did not count on them, but they had all the resources and all the money. And certainly Lozovsky's position was closely focused on what can we do to make the revolution politically 
when he's in Berlin. So the point is, I'm saying, is it possible to argue, like many of the front organizations, that in fact this is about saying, don't touch Soviet Russia, we're here, we can cause trouble, we can make actions, and there were many fantastic German trade union communists uh, who, I mean, in the Hamburg docks we could speak about, but that's, that's my question. Is it in fact about saying, we're here, don't dare touch us in Moscow? Well, it's very difficult to answer that. I mean, I, it's, I would say that this is more a contribution than a question. Um, <laughs> well, but, uh, um, well, so, no, all I can say is that, that you posted as a question, but it sounds very reasonable. What you say is, sounds very reasonable as, as, a, mo as a motive, shall we say. Um, <coughs> but it's certainly, it's not really what I meant. So, uh, I, I didn't mean, mean it that way, that, that, that you know, that was to defend the Soviet Union in whatever way possible. So it wouldn't just be in terms of propaganda, it would be in other terms as well. Uh, I'm Nick. Uh, the, um, I guess what I'm interested in, I, I've not, uh, I was aware of the existence of the prof in term before, but this is the first, this is the most I've ever heard about it, so thanks for a very in interesting talk. Uh, I am interested though, I'm interested in what exactly, the and you, you touched, touched on this, and obviously the situation varied from country to country, country and so, so on, what the relationship was between the com in turn and the prof in turn and between com, com, com communists and uh, the national sec, 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 sections of Rhine. Uh, it, it, it seems contradictory, it, it sounds to me like Rhine emerged before the full uh, uh, the script before the full emergence of the United Front tactic and strategy of the calm of the calm of the calm in turn. You described that there were tensions, the obvious tensions between the two, because the danger of the prof in turn is it's going to split uh, revolutionary from reformist workers, while the United Front uh, strategy obviously is about uniting them and trade unions are an obvious vehicle for uniting reformists and revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. So to attempt to organize the revolutionaries in such organizations is transparently breaking completely with the strategy of the United Front. Where they're attempting to organize fractions within the trade unions or revolutionaries so that they can win control of it, then that uh, is in line with the strategy of the United Front. So uh, I guess, and, and, and then the uh, sort of turn to social, the social fascist line uh, from 28 onwards was um, uh, uh, was a break with the United Front, obviously. So uh, you can see that Rylu would uh, have 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 more of a role then. So I'm, I'm interested really in uh, perhaps you could expand on these tensions and the way that uh, uh, the Comintern sought to use Rylu to push the United Front or, or was there uh, 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 or, or, or was there really not much in the way of commonality between the strategy which Rylu was seeking to assert and the United Front uh, stra stra strategy. Also second question really in terms of how often did Riley hold uh, an international con con congress? We're in, we know about the congresses of the Comintern and so on. How many of those did Crockington hold? You mentioned <coughs> one or two where there's a struggle yeah. to make sure yeah. that the syndicalists did didn't take con control. Yeah. How often that did that okay. happen? Thank you. A, interesting question. Um, but the same questions you said in the first, it's the same question I'll just answer, as far as I know there were four, a total of four meetings, or congresses rather, um, and they set up a central council uh, to just kind of, just like the ECU with the Commons, they set, set up a central council of the province of the Royal to administer matters in, in the intervening time. And the central council met very rarely indeed as well. So, um, no, there, there, weren't, there, there were one or two meetings, I would say four. Um, 
it's, it's far less far less systematized than the comment than the commentary, I think. Um, and as for the answer to the first question, which is more difficult, um, I think uh, for one thing, uh, you used the word attempted. Um, I think one has to remember that um, there were already these divisions existing. Uh, you know, there were these syndicalist and anarchist organizations existing even before the rider was set up. So there was some reason uh, to, if, if you did think that it was a good idea to unify revolutionary uh, trade unionists, then there was a reason for setting up the Rider, um, because these organizations did exist. It wasn't just that there were um, uh, communist militants working within uh, trade unions um, uh, who, who, were, who, who should be uh, advised to stay within those unions and try to convert them. No, there were actually not only not only were the separate syndicates unions also the situation, as I mentioned, got so bad in France and Czechoslovakia that there was a, a direct split. So an existing trade union, actually uh, trade union centre, I should say, national centre, uh, split up into two, and it was this was a, a, a progress a process which was which couldn't be stopped. And I don't think anything the Comintern did or the, the United Front, uh, the supporters of the United Front did could stop this happening, it, it just happened. Having happened, then they were constantly trying to put things back together again. And of course, there, there was there was a move, again, I didn't say much about this, but it, it did happen. There, there were constant attempts to kind of end the splits and, and, and not just to bring communist uh, trade unions back together, together with social democrats, but to bring the Rhino together with the IFTU. I mean, there was, there was an attempt to overcome that split as well. So the, the really, the, 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 the United Front in its fullest form, um, as it was they were appearing to develop in the mid-1920s, involved bringing, it really involved the liquidation of the Rhino, because it involved bringing the Rhino back into, into the, into the IFTU, so, so that, that the two would join together. But of course, they could never, they could never actually agree on that. Um, so that's one thing I'd say, and I think there's another underlying question, uh, the underlying underlying element to your question. Um, it is whether well, there was some kind of contradiction between Comintern and Rivalu's strategy, um, and I, I would say there may have been an implicit contradiction, but it could never be explicit because the Comintern was always in control. I think I, 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 I think I stressed that sufficiently. The common term was ultimately what the common term said went. And as a matter of fact, uh, common term meets common term congresses were always timed to precede rival congresses by about a month, or, or even to coincide with them. There was, there was one occasion where people were going back and forwards and attending common term in the morning and rival in the, in the afternoon. Um, because, of course, a lot of the people uh, who were delegates to the Rhino were also delegates to, to the Comintern Congresses. So, the, so the, the two points there, they, they were very much um, uh, in, arm in arm, shall we say, or hand in hand, um, firstly. And secondly, the Comintern was very much the senior partner. And as I, as I said, from 1925 onwards, the Eki, again, why would the Eki have the right to do this? Because it was the Executive Committee of the Comintern. The Eki said uh, that um, the Rhino could not issue any statement unless it had been agreed by the Eki beforehand. So, in other words, the Comintern rule uh, uh, completely. So, I, I think that's, that's the other point I'd like to make in right. Understand? I'm very I, I always uh, curious about Bolsheviks uh, or Politico's understanding approach uh, of democracy within the trade unions. Because if you reflect their understanding to all over Europe, uh, they politically deep and they decide about policies. Because we all know the importance of the uh, the factory committee's uh, impact on revolution, 1917, and also democratic uh, democratic uh, procedure within the factories and any kind of working class organizations. Uh, they were electing their own representatives, 
a decision when they are a, they are going to make a decision. They were coming together to make a decision what to do about their policies. But after the revolution, what happened? What was the Politburo's understanding approach? Were they appointed uh, appointing their own uh, communist candidates, top of the uh, trade unions, or they were letting uh, workers elect their own uh, trade unions representatives, trade union representatives? And it is very local, I know that, but it, uh, it would affect, it would reflect the uh, general policy of trade unionism. And sometimes, in my opinion, caused serious fractionism because they were like a representative of the political, not the real working class. I don't know if I'm clear. Yeah, yes, yes, you are clear. I think that's more, that's more a question about communism in general than, than about the right view. I mean, um, I am talking about the right view here, yeah. but um, firstly, and secondly, as far as democratic procedures go, I think it, I think it probably varied. Um, I think it may well be that um, they did operate in, in a lot of cases in Europe. I mean, might have, if whatever was happening in the Soviet Union is, is another question, but I think they did operate more in, 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 in the rest of Europe, I think. But as I say, this is really more a question about communism, <coughs> about, about communism, the structure of communist um, activities than, than about the right of it. I, I think if I join uh, also with a kind of a continuing question, yeah. contribution question, non starters. Uh, and also, this is, I know you don't like to speculate, and you always are against speculation, but you kind of create an atmosphere. I, I like longer. I, I feel that we went back to 30 years ago when you were carefree <laughs> students and <laughs> speculating about communism and the world. So uh -huh. place. I think the question, Ariza, Ask is in the same direction what Norman mentioned. I mean, Riley, uh, as I listened from you and I read this before, uh, is in the same category of organization like foreign communist politics. And because we are talking most of this period is under uh, And I suppose the failure of the German Revolution was a turning point. And after that, I don't see any clear, strong indication that Moscow wanted re to see revolution anywhere else. And most of the communist parties <laughs> and, and trade union activities and, and rival was there for them to have a presence when needed to put pressure on the, uh, on the capitalist powers. Uh, and their main essential aim was uh, defense of the socialist homeland, uh, socialist country. So that was the priority, always remained after that. Uh, I know you don't want to speculate, but I, I, I just wonder if you think we are in the right direction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I, I, yeah, I mean, I can't just play a job with that. I, I, I think that's how it was. And, and, uh, but, but of course, um, the book I translated by Tostov doesn't really go into this question because it is speculative. Um, I mean, um, as far as the, not only are the official pronouncements are concerned, we have to remember you've got official pronouncements, but you also got some archives and some you know, some statements by people, uh, unguarded statements. In both cases, they don't stress this uh, this aspect, this, this aspect of having the comment, sorry, the comment said, well, and, and the prophet uh, as a kind of, instruments of pressure. I mean, I think this is a kind of construction put on it afterwards by political theorists, rather than a, rather than you know something which is actually evidence-based. I think if you, to make it evidence-based, you'd have to have someone saying, "Well, this is what we're planning to do," rather than you know deducing from their actual actions. And this is how they must have meant, because otherwise it would be all complete nonsense. I mean, yes, you could say that, but as far as the actual concrete evidence goes, the concrete evidence. And even if you go into the sources, the confidence, they, they do seem to be saying um, saying what they mean, shall we say. Um, but I mean, this does hold, raise the whole question of, um, of how the mind works. 
mm. and of, you know, and of how, um, how how a certain set of ideas beca people it becomes uh, embedded in people's minds, and then they see the world through that perspective. Yeah. Exactly. I think yeah. this is this is this is the, isn't it the point? I think the, especially for the communist uh, Bolshevik uh, and Stalinist leadership, uh, the double speak. And they always present something outside of the world, even to their members, yeah. in a way. But there was always a second. Um, for instance, they never say that we do this because of our because just one country, socialism. <coughs> they never say socialism in one country requires sacrificing communist well. Of course, they will say this. Yeah. But they also know mm -hmm. the, the consequence of their policies would be that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think. Even if we go to every single archive of what they want, even if we open everything, we couldn't find anything which explicitly pronounces this in this way. And, and, and you are right, it's not only an international political theory construction by looking at the things and then interpreting it in a, in a particular way, which wouldn't be just a pure speculation, of course. Yeah. Which would be just, uh, I certainly didn't disagree with you. Yes, I certainly didn't been. disagree. No, no, I, but I don't think that you can find any concrete evidence. Uh, can I add to that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I would say reading the uh, German files from the kind of level that comes into the German secretariat, the kind of what becomes a leadership in the Stalin period, more or less right down to the kind of level of sub-districts and, uh, and their kind of directives or circulars to parties, that you, although it doesn't say Okay, all, absolutely all we want is to create a presence. It runs through your mind very frequently. I mean, it's a kind of key thought, and that historians too are charged with interpreting, interpreting the uh, information. And I would say that there are indirect reference to, references to this that do come up in the documentation. So there is a subtext in 1928 that it's nothing to do with revolution. But in 1928, the 6th Congress of the Common Towns, really based on the, the, the feeling, uh, having some concerns that there would be a war, and that the, the defence of, of Soviet Russia at a time of industrialisation is going to be important, and that these lines are pushed out. And the very fact that they are, one, pushed out for all communist parties, and secondly, they almost never had any money. So you have the situation that almost no important strike is funded by uh, the Profum Town, but they had huge amounts of money for things they wanted. They had huge amounts of money for propaganda. There's all sorts of artists, John Hartfield, uh, who <coughs> kind of anglicised his name, the photomontage person. All these people are the, uh, around the, the kind of publishing groups, the Mallet Publishing House. I mean, there's just this vast supply of money but it was, in fact, elements on the left of the Social Democrats who did get money for strikes. So in the Great Depression, uh, it's their money that allows a strike wave in the autumn of 32. The communists are absolutely baffled about what to do about this. So I mean, how do you interpret that? The job of the historian is to say, well, what does this add up to? And that, I mean, if you're writing a PhD, for example, what do you make of the information? What's your contribution? I, I would say that, although I can't think of anyone who's really hammered on this, I mean, it's in the literature, I would say that that is, the, that is a, a, not just speculation, but I would go as far as saying it, it is a very plausible explanation. Um, and the information is, is probably not direct enough to, to say, well, here's the quote, but, but, but that, 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 that to me seems to be overwhelmingly uh, 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 the way that I would read the files in Germany. Mm -hmm. in Germany. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm sorry. Well, well, I mean, there's the, I just want to say something in response to that. Um, I mean, clearly, the, the motive, the motive would be the fear of the danger of war, mm -hmm. the, war the war psychosis, if you like, yeah. in the Soviet yeah. Union in 1927. Um, and the response to uh, disappointment at the complete failure of um, the United Front efforts, which is demonstrated by 1907. Um, and um, I suppose a kind of economic analysis, which 
suggested that the there were cap contradictions with capitalism were going to be become more extreme, and therefore they had to respond to that. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure those things are in the archives as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those motivations. Uh, yeah, I think we're sure. Eh? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. I mean, it was really educative. Thank you. This paper, I mean, I read about Provincial before, but not this much. Um, that's first thing. Second thing, when I was reading the archives, search archives, I I noticed that Kuhunter was helping not the trade unions in Turkey, because there wasn't legal trade union in the 1930s. There wasn't trade union at all. And uh, they were helping the political prisoners. They were sending aid to political prisoners, to even to the other the other prison, there were several uh, communist mm -hmm. uh, sort of kidnapped mm -hmm. <laughs> after 1927 uh, arrests and 28 ar arrests. And they were sending monthly $100, dollars to those communists. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing I want to say. Uh, others ask question about the factory uh, committees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What, why factory communities is important for the left-wing movement? The factory communities unites the workers, not only the communists, everyone. Believers, non-believers, uh, syndicalists, anarchists, even sometimes maybe fascists, mm -hmm. will be united in the factory floor to act against the capitalist uh, employee, employers. Mm -hmm. and this is the base of the movement from 1905 onward. Mm -hmm. And now, what we see with the creation of rival, mm -hmm. this factory flow is divided in two. Factory committees cannot be set up anymore. Because the mindset of the communists or communist any person to create the trade union to join the rival or force to trade union to join the rival. Mm -hmm. But there are people in the factory floor do not want to join the rival. It's not necessarily a social democrat or anarchist or syndicalist. Mm -hmm. That means rival creation is dividing the forces. That is the question starting when you were talking about this. Yeah. That was the question <laughs> came to my mind. And that is my first education in the left-wing movement. Yeah. Workers' movement shouldn't be split. Yeah. Then I asked how on earth in 1967 revolutionary trade unions were split from the uh, general uh, <coughs> Turkish trade union. Yeah. It was a burning question in my mind too, but split happened in the factory floor in 1921, or by 1920. And probably mm -hmm. this was the first example, and now repeated itself. Yes. In various mm -hmm. On the other hand, in Portugal, yeah. under the Salazar regime, communists were encouraged to go into the fascist syndical, uh, syndical uh, uh, trade unions, yes. and uh, form the workers' movement in the factory floor, united workers' movement in the factory floor against Salazar. And they were active till 1974. Yeah. Well, I, can I just say to that, I don't think Raidu intended to do that kind of split. I don't think it was an intention. Um, I think, and also, I mean, the Raidu wasn't set up to be exclusively communist. It was set up to, to do precisely that job of unifying the workers together, provided they were revolutionary. I mean, they, they, they provided unifying revolutionary trade unions. As for causing a split, I mean, as I said before, in some cases I think a split was developing, had developed. The October Revolution created a split. Mm -hmm. we, mm -hmm. Okay, it was unified in, 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 in Russia, but I mean, it creates a split elsewhere. Yes. Because there's a whole lot of people who are very anxious about it, say it was a terrible thing happening. So there's, there's the elements of a split in the first place. Mm -hmm. so that, is it, I mean, are they causing the split or are they recognizing the fact of the split and trying to 
and try to proceed on that basis. Just one factual question. Uh, what has been the attitude of council communists in Riley? Well, the, yeah, interesting point. Um, council communists um, did, I don't know which ones we're talking about. I mean, um, on the whole, the Riley was set up to for them to be included in it, to, to, be, to be part of it. Um, but, and, and that, I mean, I suppose I didn't mention the Council of Communists really, but the I mean, I was, you could add them together with the syndicates and say syndicates and Council of Communists. I mean, what, I suppose the ALU is an example in Germany of Council of Communists. Um, and the, I think they, there was a short period of time, I think I stress this, there was a short period of time in 2021 when there was a possible um, association between them and the province. I mean, I don't think they were. I mean, I'm not very familiar with this, you know, this this relationship because just us spoke very much stress as the syndicates. But I, I think there was an occasion during the 2021 when the council of communists were uh, associated with the province or the or the Rado, and uh, this, but this did last more than I think 22 is when half the end, and, and which which coincides with the. Uh, I suppose a split between the council communists and the orthodox communists anyway. So, yeah, it's an interesting point. But I, I don't have a very precise answer to it. <coughs> but clearly, uh, further research would be needed. Mm -hmm. I Colin, it's my point, and it's always point. What I'm trying to understand uh, uh, is Bolsheviks or Comitat uh, or Politburo was trying to use Riley to export their own ideas or put, uh, in their own ways using this sympathy to the revolution within the Europe to uh, try to protect the Soviet Union. But if, uh, if it is the case, they don't trust working class uh, and the working people uh, which they can educate themselves if they use the democracy properly to make a decision and understand what's going on exactly. Because if, if uh, they, people discuss enough and freely and then make the decision, they all become a part of the action, a part of the movement, which is very important. Because voluntarily they are taking part, brings unbelievable energy, revolutionary energy. But if you appoint uh, someone or uh, force to, uh, people to believe something, it causes very uh, serious splits between the working class movement. And their way, which is still work, and there is no Soviet Union at all. Well, and I don't know what to reply. I mean, except to say that, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think the Bolsheviks. Um, thought the way you do. I don't think they thought that right. way. They were entirely opposed to that point of view. Um, and they thought that discipline was important and um, they thought uh, a set of principles which was laid down by Lenin um, was, was to be upheld. And um, but this, because it was correct, because it succeeded in October, um, and yes, I mean, they did want to impose it on the, on the, the other, the, the people that, that, that joined. And this was real, the real reason why the syndicalists and anarchists were unable to stay within the Rider, because that, as, as I think I said at the beginning, there were, as possibly it was an illusion that they could kind of cooperate together. But just for that short, brief t period of time, it appeared possible for them to cooperate together because they had a lot in common, but there were these very basic things that they didn't have in common. So I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying I, I, I think that um, uh, that the, the, there was this this brief time, and the, and the, the, the uh, Jostov lays it out very clearly that there are a lot of people coming from all over the world to these first early conference um, or rival conferences or congresses, and and uh, trying to put their point of view and trying to. Uh, trying to prevent the imposition of a very rigid set of 
Bolshevik ideas, but they failed. And having, because they were unable to prevent this, then they had to leave. They mm -hmm. did leave. So I, I'm not disagreeing with you. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, I, this period is very uh, significant in the Soviet Union in terms of what's happening in the communist movement. And mm -hmm. uh, quite early in this moment, Turkey was ex expelled, and then all the uh, fight against Trotsky and Turkey supporters, and in the very middle of this period, there was the Great Purges. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if all these things are happening in the Soviet Union directly or indirectly affected uh, the, uh, the way things uh, in Russia, because a number of those people they are trying to keep together were being expelled, executed, targeted. In the main land. Yes, well, I mean, uh, the, yes, uh, thank you. Um, clearly, we can go back further back than the Great Purges. I mean, um, we can go back to 1921, where, of course, the syndicalists um, and the anarchists were very upset about what was happening to their comrades in, within Russia. Yes. Um, and um, th they, they tried to put pressure. Um, and really, that's another that's another reason why, in the long run, they weren't able to stay within the within the rider. So that's one cool thing. The other thing is about the great projects. I mean, actually, if we're talking specifically about them. The Riley was pretty well on its last legs by then. I mean, you know, 1936, Dimitrov, Charles Stalin. What a waste of time the rider was. 1937, the rider was uh, uh, was ended. And as I as I hinted. Um, most of the foreigners who were actually working for the Rider were allowed to go home, but not the Poles, because the Polish party was, uh, as you know, dissolved and all the Poles were executed or dead sent to camps. Um, now I think they were simply executed. Um, and, and the people, the Polish workers at the Rider didn't survive. But, but the, the non Polish workers, uh, in the, I mean, functionaries within the Rider, were sent uh, back to the various parts of Europe. I don't know whether it helps contribute to this again about Germany, where I know certain details. Thank you very much. By the way, my name is Long Lance. Um, you told us a lot of things which I didn't know about. But <clears throat> and I know a few things which perhaps contribute to this, this yes. debate. Uh, the Communist International, or the Socialist International, was split according to nation states, according to national divisions yeah. in the Baal Congress. I don't know, uh, 1910, or I forget the date. Anyway, they, the international was split according to national lines. And I think as a result of this split, the German trade unions gave their money for the First World War. They, they offered the whole uh, money for the fighting the First World War. Mm -hmm. That for was the war 1914. Effort. For the war effort. Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht opposed it yeah. in Parliament, mm -hmm. and they founded the Communist Party, mm -hmm. which is very understandable, I, I would say. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's, it's a real, this is a conflict mm -hmm. which is fundamental, I think, in the, in the whole development of the divisions we are talking about. And there's another division which um, I remember after the uh, First World War in Germany as well. Um, the construction unions after the German Revolution founded socialist cooperatives. These socialist cooperatives were then adopted by the trade union and the trade union turns them into capitalist enterprises and created a huge conglomerate which was owned by the trade union. Mm -hmm. Well that is not very socialist anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's so a socialist enterprise will turn into a capitalist enterprise. Mm -hmm. And that was another huge division. And what I think uh, my, my conclusion is a bit that um, the socialist concept of 
um, the working class taking over the production process and then also civil government hasn't progressed neither under capitalism very much nor under socialism. And I tell you another experience from Germany, the post-war development after the Second World War, and socialism and capitalism, the working class under capitalism that made more progress than the working class under socialism in terms of living standards. And as a result, workers from East Germany came to West Germany. It was a big exodus because capitalism proved to be more effective for the working class, for their everyday experience. And my conclusion is a bit, um, this socialist concept has this, has this double face. And uh, we are now living in a period where we can't use these concepts anymore for the future. I think this was, this was a dilemma which couldn't be resolved and which we are not going to resolve in hindsight. But, it is, but, but the, the conflict is, if you look at it in the details, and you, you must take note, this is impossible. They turn workers' cooperatives into a capitalist company. That's the end of, 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 of socialism. But, but what, did, what did the Soviets do? The Soviets didn't advance the working class. The dictatorship of the proletariat was a compromise, and it was always assumed that this was a traditional period, even after the Second World War, the Comintern was supposed to be a tra transition to communism, but not. It wasn't communism, and it was definitely not communism. You've raised some very broad issues here, um, uh, but there's one thing I'd like to concentrate on, the first, what you said at the beginning about the First World War and about um, the decision by the Social Democrats to support, the, uh, the German Social Democrats mm -hmm. to support the war effort. I think that, uh, that does remind me that actually I was wrong to concentrate entirely on the October Revolution, saying this split was caused by the October Revolution. No, the First World War was a tremendous factor in causing this split in the labor movement. And that one, one really has to go back to there. But it was and an you imperialist know, war. Sorry? But it was an imperialist war. Well, it, well yes, of course. But it, it, the point is it was a factor in splitting the, the movement. Um, so we, you can't say that the rioters somehow split the movement because the movement was already split. It was split mm. as a result. Not, I mean, I, I said it was split because of the October Revolution. It was also split because, but further back from that because of the First World War, the war was happening in the First World War. Yes. Sorry, you have the other chair. <laughs> I just want to say something more about, obviously there was, there was a split as a result of the First World War uh, in the Socialist International. And uh, uh, after the October Revolution, uh, the Bolsheviks were able, because of their international prestige, to set up a communist international. This was a split, though, at the level of political par party. And it doesn't necessarily follow. I mean, the uh, theory of the Bolsheviks was that, uh, after October, was that you needed to have a split with, uh, 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 with the class trade of 1914 politically, mm. so you needed separate communist parties, but it doesn't necessarily follow from that that you need to uh, split the working class beyond that, because obviously the objective of the communist parties is to win the support of the wor working class, and um, uh, for instance the Soviets in Russia, when uh, uh, after the revolution, they were controlled uh, by uh, the Mensheviks and the Social Revolutionaries, had a majority in the Soviets, and these can be seen as uh, a, a form 
of the United Front, if you like, because both the reformists and revolutionaries were involved in there. The Bolsheviks didn't, through 1917, have a strategy of splitting the Soviets. So you had revolutionary Soviets and reformists. So, 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 it's their object objective was after when the formula of the United Front was created, they looked back at this and said the strategy through 1917 was, in retrospect, the classic United Front approach. They were seeking to win the support of the workers as a whole. As you described, the factory committees provide a forum where all the workers exist, and the United Front strategy would be that uh, revolutionaries need to operate within that and seek to win majority support. So that would be, so as a consequence of all these uh, poli pol pol political divisions, there were, as you described, divisions within the trade union and workers movement and all of that. But uh, the strategy of the United Front would be to seek to overcome those and to unite as far as possible workers who were affiliated to reformist organisations and those affiliated to revolutionary organisations so that the revolutionaries could win a majority there. So I think to the extent that Rylu contributed to splitting trade unions, it was acting against the theory of the united front. Uh, to the extent it was just working with a, a pre-existing situation and it was doing the best that it could. And it's interesting the point about the syndicalists and anarchists already were had separate workers or organisations. So the objective of trying to unite night with them was a different issue as well, a different perspect perspective on 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 it. I just wanted to emphasise that from my reading of that period, period, period there's no necessary, there's no necessary follow-through follow, follow from the political split uh, to dividing all the, the whole workers' movements along those uh, lines. And, but the one question I have <laughs> is, what happened in 1928-29? Because then the Comintern definitely abandoned a united front approach and they uh, uh, were seeking, they uh, described uh, the social democrats as social fas fascists and so on. So what you described as the left turn is a very sectarian turn. So that, that must have had huge ramifications for the approach that the profit turn would take. Yeah, I just want to uh, comment on some the first thing you said in your earlier parts of your part of your remarks, um, uh, uh, saying that it wasn't it wasn't a necessary result that the split in the political movement in 1914 meant a split in trade union movement. Well, actually, Tostov in this book has a lot of evidence, which I mean I didn't actually know myself before. It actually shows the deep divisions within the trade union movement which are also created by the First World War. So I, I wouldn't make that distinction myself. I wouldn't say, you know, you split the political parties, but you've still got the uni uni unified trade union movement. Absolutely not. You've got, you know, it's split down the middle. So, um, and, and insofar as the, the trade union movement stays united, it is uni it, it will be, the social democratic trade union movement will be united on the side of the war effort, whether it's the, Allied war, you know, whichever side in the imperialist war, they they're on that side. So it be united on the on the side of the British or on the side of the Germans, whatever. But if if it stays united, if it if it splits, then there is a minority of opponents of the war. What do you do with them? Well, I mean, you welcome them, don't you? <laughs> well, no, but there wasn't a, a communist international. No, I know, but that, that's the point. You see, that, 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 this I, no, no, of course, but the idea of this comes up during this time. Yeah. The, the idea of separate organisation comes up because of what's happened at the First World War. Because this gentleman over there pointed it out. John. I forget your name. John. John. John pointed out the importance of the First World War. I think this this big no, the division is absolutely crucial it's it's both, on both sides of the Both parts of the movement. Written here things like the Shop Stewards movement, mm -hmm. yes. which becomes 
increasingly militant and, uh, yeah. and de facto opposed to the uh, war. Absolutely. Operating yeah. within the existing labour movement, quite yeah. a different form. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, which and is and not so, a fact. As I said, there are different, yeah. different possibilities in different yeah. places. You know, in some cases yeah. where the social democratic uh, rule was not so strict and not so rigorously in, enforced, there that's possible. Mm. Other places, not possible. So maybe one last question, we ask more than uh, <laughs> this, this is the first time he's been here. Well, that, I, I was very kind of you. Um, well, I'll I, I say what I was thinking about. I would say that, in fact, it is not uh, Luxembourg and Liebknecht, certainly not Lo Rosa Luxembourg, who wants to split the movement. In fact, it's another grouping. The grouping around the, the, the coalesces around the Spartacus want to remain in this grouping and it becomes the independent socialist. And that uh, this is a very large grouping that's united by opposition to the imperialist war. So Bernstein's in this uh, uh, organisation, Ernst Doiman is in this organisation. It's not quite. We'll, uh, yeah, you, you, then, then you should then you should have the you should have the last word in just a second. And I think that to some extent, when we looked at this early period that Ben spoke about and it raised lots of questions, it seems to me that if we are looking at Germany, the thing that makes Bolshevism really attractive is that there is an expectation in Germany that there will be socialist reform, and that doesn't happen, and it is blocked by. Uh, older leadership grouping in the SPD, um, NOSCA and these people, who hate revolution ever. This group suppresses this. And I would say that there is a period of fluidity that ends sometime in the early 20s, but in fact it's much um, that, that, that you are seeing a polarisation. You either move towards supporting Bolshevism or social democracy. I would also agree with whoever said that the Social Democrats are forcing splits by pushing communists out. I think that's true. So I have to turn it into a question now. The question is this. Do you think there's a period of fluidity where the party political trade union lines are not yet extremely clear into the early 20s that allows the profiteer to think we can win wider support but that then later closes up. Yeah, I think I did suggest that. Oh, you did, sorry. Um, sorry. Um, you but did. I think, yeah, didn't, didn't John want to have a last word? <laughs> oh, you <laughs> should. That's an option. It's not that good speed. Yeah. But you didn't want to split. Well, that was the prior organization of which the Communist Party was then founded. Not, not just the the, 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 was founded in 1916 by including Rosa Luxemburg and Galitnitz and a few more, very small group. And uh, they were, but, but the USPD mm -hmm. was a kind of concession of social democrats to go to the left. So that was a split within the social democratic mm -hmm. party. And they, most of them rejoined the social democrats in the Congress in 1923, I think. And the communist, but, but yeah, what is yeah. interesting, the as you mentioned, that, what is interesting is, before all the Luxembourg and Kalnick were killed, both in the founding Congress of the Communist Party, um, objected to the majority. The majority were against joining the Social Democrats in Parliament, um, and all the Luxembourg and Kalnick we must join. We must uh, uh, have a union with them. Yeah. There are lots of forgotten well, but, but but These are details which, are, which don't uh, help very much. I, I, I think we understand. probably should finish the structured part of the meeting now. I think many of you would like to stay around and talk one to one. Of course, you are free, but I just would like to thank you again for this extremely inspiring talk and creating yeah. all this opportunity for us to discuss. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Last uh, MR seminar before uh, autumn. In the autumn, uh, 
Nick is going to start giving us the first seminar in September, last Friday of September. He's going to explore the definition of socialism in Marx, whether it existed or not, how that did it exist, what should we do in defining in uh, well, for the future. This will, uh, I hope, open a new perspective for all of us. Uh, then we are going to have a October activity of Emma together with University of Kiel, Kiel and uh, we are going to uh, have one day workshop on Russian Revolution and it is effect implications for the rest of the world. We are going to try to cover certain aspects. We cannot cover everything, but certain aspects. And we are going, we are duly going to send you information. The workshop will be in uh, Stock and Trent in University of Kiev. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.